Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Pluralsight Spotlight. I'm your host for this episode, Adam Gunn. If you're new to this series, let me set the table for what you can plan on for the next 20 minutes. Our Spotlight series is a chance to meet some of the incredible people, personalities, and teams that differentiate the Pluralsight brand. Our brand is built on the backs of our incredible course authors, training architects, developers, engineers, and our DevRel team. They bring the best of themselves to the courses and platform each and every day, and it's my privilege to introduce a few of those personalities to you through this series. Today, I'd like to introduce you to Jeremy Warden. Jeremy's passion is helping developers get better at what they do. He's currently the most senior member of the Pluralsight DevRel team and an avid blogger, speaker, and recently Twitch streamer. Jeremy has two decades of experience in engineering, building software from everything from Fortune 100 companies to tiny startups. Jeremy stays immersed in the .NET Azure world while keeping one foot in the Linux ecosystem, building Python and Go applications. He's primarily focused on backend API development and cloud infrastructure and finding new ways to deploy software safely and quickly. Recently, Jeremy's been proudly repping the title of world's okayest developer. And it's, I'm excited to click in with him on what he means by that. Let's give a warm spotlight welcome to Jeremy Morgan. Welcome to the spotlight, Jeremy. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Glad to have you. So a big part of this series is diving into experts' backstories. And I'm really excited to do that today. And let's start with this concept of world's okayest developer. I know you don't right. throw it around lightly, and I know it's not said in jest, but give the audience a sense of what you mean by it. What does this mean to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to make it a part of my brand, actually. So what it is, is it seems sort of self-deprecating, but really it's uh, a way to champion humility to people. Um, so when I first started in tech, I noticed that I learned things very quickly. So, you know, I'd go home, stick my nose in a book over a weekend and come back and, and just start building things. And I just learned it really quick. So when I was younger, I thought, well, I must be a genius then. I just must be so smart, you know, and I, I did have a, a bit of an ego when I first started out um, and wouldn't have called myself the world's okayest developer. However, I, after a certain amount of time, you know, you start getting good enough at something to know what you don't know. And there's like real highs and real lows, you know, when you have that, that ego driven type thing, it's like when you're you're a genius when things work and it's great. And then you're a blithering moron when it doesn't. And so that self-talk starts to come in. And, and over the years, I realized like, I'm not a genius, right? I am not Grace Hopper or Donald Knuth or John Carmack or something like that, but I'm good at solving problems. And uh, one of the things I started to learn was a little bit of humility and, and realize that, you know, I'm not one of these genius people, but that's okay. I'm good at solving problems. I'm good at helping the people around me. And then it, it kind of dulls the blow a little bit when things go bad. It's like, well, of course they went bad because I'm a human being and, and you know, this is how things are. And so now I'm kind of trying to, to push that towards uh, the people that are watching me do something. So if you're watching me on stage or on video or something like that, just know that like I'm one of you, I mess up too, and that's okay. And, you know, we're all just trying to get through this together and just kind of, I, I'm trying to basically say it's okay to not be uh, the world's greatest programmer as long as you're trying hard. Um, the one thing that I that I ended up learning after years is it's actually my passion that was helping me learn all those things so quickly. You know, it's not some kind of super genius type of thing. Just I was passionate enough to care about it. And as long as the people who are, you know, a part of my audience or a part of my peer group are also passionate about it and know that that's all they need is that passion, that, that it's okay, then I, I think I've done my job. And I think humility is kind of a superpower. Plus, pe people want to work with you when you're uh, humble. I love that. Well, let's take a journey down memory lane of the world's okayest developer and see what we can learn from the, <laughs> the life history of, of Jeremy Morgan. I did my homework for this episode and spent some time on your LinkedIn profile. So... We're going to go way back with Jeremy Morgan. I noticed one of your first pit stops of your career was at Hollywood Video, which you and I are older. We understand the glory days of Hollywood <laughs> Video, working in their corporate yeah. office. I mean, that sounds pretty cool. What were you doing for them and what core skills did you learn in those early days of your career? Um, it's cool that you brought that up because Hollywood Video was one of my favorite jobs ever. 
Um, not just because it was my first dev job, but because the culture there was awesome, um, very customer focused and very empowering. And I found that same thing with Pluralsight, which is one of the reasons I, I really enjoy Pluralsight. It's that culture. So Hollywood Video was one of my favorite jobs. And I was hired there as a network engineer, actually, because that's what uh, my major was. And that's what my experience was at that time. And they had this wild idea at Hollywood Video that uh, they're customer focused. So they want you to go and answer the phones for a while and speak to the customers before you start your job. So I went out to the call center and did the whole, hi, thank you for calling Hollywood Video. This is Jeremy. How can I help you? Oh, you got some late fees. Let me remove those. And, and I just embraced it and enjoyed it. I'm like, hey, this is kind of fun. This is cool. And uh, the director of software engineering happened to walk by and see a programming book on my desk uh, that I was trying to learn and, and started a conversation. He said, why don't you apply for a job on my team instead? So he ended up poaching me from the network engineering into software engineering. And then that's where I've been ever since. So what I did there was I wrote uh, applications in PHP and Delphi for the call center and also wrote like a portal that all of the stores would go and get their new release information. So they would go in there on Tuesdays and, and bring up this portal and say, here's the new releases. Here's the, the thing that was most rented last week, you know, the top five movies that were rented the most last week. And we pulled all this data for the stores so people could just jump in and, and get that. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I would love to look back at the code I wrote back then, <laughs> but, uh, it was, it was fun. And, um, definitely was uh, a really encouraging, awesome environment. Unfortunately, we all know why uh, I'm not working there anymore. <laughs> well, I wish you would have answered the phone when I called to get my late fees removed. I, uh, I, I kept my uh, Nintendo games a little bit too long, I think, and uh, my mom was none too happy. Uh, <laughs> let's move on in this, in this uh, career reflective period of this interview. Uh, Later on, you ended up at Intel, which again, I think another brand that a lot of people at the time in those early 2000s probably were aspiring to work for a, a, a mega enterprise like Intel. I'm curious if it was everything you dreamed of working for a, a large tech company like Intel and, and what you took away from that stop and ultimately what what made you leave. Okay. Um, yeah, it totally was a, a dream gig. And that was something that I aspired to uh, years before I even started there. Um, and in many ways, it was what I expected. And in many ways, it wasn't. Um, it was very challenging, uh, extremely technical. That was what I expected and, and received. I, I didn't expect the big corporate type thing to it. So what I did there was I worked on Intel.com web development. I did some research and development. I worked on this classmate PC project, which was um, like this small foldable PC that would go out to like third world countries. Um, so really cool stuff. And what I took away from it, the biggest thing I think I took away from it is being able to work with different types of people. So that was the first time in my career that I'd worked with people from all over the world. Either they were born and raised there or they were still there. Um, you know, like Egypt and Africa and Mexico and Ireland and Russia, all these types of, of people that I had to work with every single day. And that was very new for me and I really enjoyed it. And it kind of opened my mind to a lot of things, you know, like Intel has been doing the diversity and inclusion thing since like the eighties because they had to, right. They need the best and brightest from no matter where in the world you're from. And so I really enjoyed working with and, and learning a lot about other cultures and other countries. And, um, and so that was the biggest thing I probably took away from that was I really enjoyed that. Um, I also took away kind of whether I wanted to be a generalist or a specialist, I think at Intel was where I learned which one I wanted to be because I would work with people who are like the world's top foremost expert on this chip that's on a motherboard on a PC, right? And they would know everything there ever was to know about that and go speak at conferences and stuff. Uh, but they couldn't change the wallpaper on their cell phone. You know, it's just very focused, focused stuff. And then there were folks that were very general and knew a little bit about a lot of things and had some specialties. And that's kind of where I decided that's where I wanted to be, you know, rather than be very honed in on one small thing, I wanted to do a bunch of things. Um, so that was part of the reason why I left actually is, uh, I, I didn't really like the big, huge corporate culture thing as much as I thought I would. 
Um, it wasn't really allowing me to grow and I was getting kind of pigeonholed in certain areas to where I felt like I would probably grow better if I go to a smaller company where there's more of that hustle and grind, there's more of that, uh, this is not in your job description, but we'd like you to do it anyway. Um, for me, that's exciting. <laughs> for some people, you know, they're like, that's not my job. I don't want to do it. I've always been more of a, oh, I'll give that a try type of thing. And um, I, I wanted to spend more time with my family also, if I'm being honest. I, I put in a lot, a lot of time while I was there. So, um, yeah, it was just kind of a learning experience, you know, after five years or six years, I kind of decided, okay, this is what I like and what I don't like and how I want my career to go. And so awesome. decided to do it. Don't regret it for a minute. Yeah, and let's, let's shift the conversation a little bit. We've been talking to guests about... Um, some of the superpowers that they have developed over time that kind of differentiate them. And I've known you for a while. And one of the superpowers I admire about uh, Jeremy Morgan is your passion for blogging. Um, and it seems like somewhere in that Intel, post Intel world, you started this journey of just being a, a pretty prolific blogger. At one point, you were recognized as a most valuable blogger by uh, D Zone. Um, where'd that passion kind of originate for you and, you know, why would you recommend to other developers to, you know, consider developing a blogging as a superpower? Um, one of the things I really like to write, one of the things I've always liked to write since I was a little kid. So it's kind of a, an extension of, I like to teach and I like to write. So blogging just kind of seems natural. Um, whether I'm any good at it is still, uh, the jury's still out on that, but I love to do it. So, so it's very fun for me. It doesn't feel like work to, to write something up. And I think every developer should do it. And one of the reasons is, um, blogging is kind of a dying art, right? So maybe 10 people are reading your stuff these days or 10,000. You know, I think if I started my blog today, it would probably be getting 50 to a hundred people a day. But since it's been around so long, uh, it gets more, but it, I think that developers should still do it for themselves. Cause in order to write about something, you have to understand it a lot deeper. So when you go to learn something and you publish some code or whatever and get it out, that's fine. But as soon as you start to write about it, you have to build a thought process around it. You have to understand it deeper and it helps you, you know, walk away from it, knowing and understanding that thing better. So I still tell developers all the time, have a blog put it out there and use it as a part of your portfolio. Cause you can go into a job interview and say, Oh, well here, if you want to see what I know about this, check out my 10 articles I wrote about this subject and then they can decide good or bad, whether, whether you know that thing. So I still think developers should, should blog just to, uh, just to kind of express themselves, change your thought process and then put yourself out there. Yeah. And I noticed in addition to blogging, you, you, authored nine courses on the Pluralsight platform. So help connect, like what, what drove you to this interest in, in creating courses and, and how do you decide what, what technical topics you're going to, to focus on there? One of the reasons I decided to become a Pluralsight author actually was because of Scott Allen, who was um, very prolific, one of the big early folks. And I've always liked to teach, you know, I've, I've constantly been one of those person, even if I'm just a chapter ahead of the next person, I love to teach stuff, but I never thought that I, that could be something for me because I started picturing people like professors, you know, with their elbow pads and their, you know, I'm so great. And, you know, you're all blessed to be here and listen to me and, you know, egotistical people or big giant people on stage that are like smashing watermelons and stuff with their demo. And I just thought, you know, I'm not, I'm not any of those people. So I'm probably never going to, to do that. And then I started taking plural site courses and Scott's were one of the first ones that I took. And I'm like, this guy's like calm, he's kind, he's humble and just like really passionate. And so I thought to myself, hey, if he can do it, then I think I can do it. You know, um, I don't see him smashing any watermelons or acting like a jerk and, you know, people love him. So if he can do it, I can do it. And so that was literally kind of the stepping stone where I'm like, I think I'll choose Pluralsight as a place to apply for and become an author. Um, and luckily I did. <laughs> luckily they accepted me, changed my life to say the least. And tell the audience, like, do you have a favorite course that you've authored? Is there a one you're most proud of or a recent one that uh, you would 
highly endorse. I, I think my favorite one is probably the one on the ghost standard library. Um, mostly because I kind of, I didn't, I wouldn't say copy to style, but there's something I like about, uh, Deborah Karata's courses that she packs so much information into a very small amount of time. And that's what I tried to do with that course. I was like, I'm going to take this big, huge thing and cram it into a couple of hours. And I felt like I was able to do that successfully. And so there's a ton of information. So that one's probably my favorite, um, as far as just of the courses that I'm kind of proud of. I think that one, I did a, a good job of, of really giving a lot of takeaways in the course so that people don't feel like their time is wasted. Um, I don't know if I'll always build courses that way, but that was kind of the experiment. Like, like let's see how much I can cram into this small amount of time. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about this in terms of like, sometimes we measure success on hours viewed. And, and I've talked to a lot of other authors that the amount of time and energy they put in and actually condensing learning and making learning efficient um, is such a powerful thing. I think it goes often underappreciated the amount of time and energy um, plural site authors put into that concept of, you know, why spend two or three hours on something if I can condense it and, and get the concept to land and, you know, in, in half the time or a third of the time. So, yeah, it's, it's very challenging um, to kind of triage and say, well, what is this? Is this important? Yes, it's important, but how important? And there's a lot of triage involved with that that makes it extremely difficult, at least for me, yeah. to do so. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit because I, I think maybe a, a lot of the audience and Jeremy Morgan fans that are hopefully turning in maybe don't know that you have a side hustle. Um, maybe you have more than one, but the one that always intrigues me is when I learned that Jeremy Morgan somehow finds time to be a volunteer firefighter uh, in his hometown in the Portland, Oregon area. I, I, unpack that a little bit. Like, how did you get into firefighting? Why have you maintained this role in your community? And how might it relate to things that developers encounter as they fight the day-to-day -day fires of, of uh, you know, code? Okay. Um, yeah, so firefighting, volunteer firefighting, especially has been a big thing in my family for a long time. And I actually kind of, uh, came to it a little bit late in life compared to, I have got cousins at cousins and uncles and aunts all over at like Portland fire. And even, uh, like up in Washington, different places where they started when they were 16 and, and went through and just did the whole fire career thing from volunteer. Um, but I've always wanted to do it just as a volunteer and it was just something that I saw all my family and everyone do. So I thought it was pretty normal um, until, you know, later in life where I realized, okay, so maybe not everybody has uh, family gatherings where people jump up and run out the door. Um, but my family is used to that now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and in our area, especially in the town that I live in, we didn't have paid firefighters for a very long time. And then we had one paid firefighter and everybody else was volunteer. And now we're, we're doing a little bit better to where we have at least one paid person 24 hours a day, but still rely on volunteers very heavily. And so it's just something that, uh, we all kind of jump in and do and, and take care of. And it's been really rewarding, um, to say the least. So, um, one of the things that, that makes it a little bit different from tech life is the there's certain things like the communications are different. Like if you talk to Jeremy, the firefighter, it's entirely different from Jeremy, the de developer advocate, because you have to be more direct. You have to be more firm. It's life and death. But at the same time, there's a ton of skills that I've learned from firefighting that I've, I've brought to the, to the business world. And like one of them is uh, preparation and training are something that uh, fire skills, I guess you would call it, is something that is huge in the fire service with volunteers and paid folks to where um, there's preparation and skills are everything. Like it literally is life or death. And if you get in a crash in your car and you're stuck in there, you don't want the people showing up to not know how to use the jaws of life and get you out of there, right? There's an expectation there that that these people are as good as they can be. And uh, it's very well enforced. So every firefighter that you meet is working on something, you know, especially if you talk to them to say, well, what are you working? Well, right now I'm working on this path. And so um, skills and preparation are just huge in the fire service. And so 
um, that's one of the things where I'm like, I, I can really enjoy that. Like, I really like people that are constantly moving. You know, you don't, uh, you don't just kind of sit with the same skills and, and enjoy a decades long career, which is something that if I hadn't had familiarity with it, I probably would have thought that like, well, as soon as you can do these skills, you're probably good for 20 years, but, uh, it's constantly changing. And, and another thing that I've, I've brought to it is the panic thing. Like you can't panic in the fire service. Uh, literally it's a killer. And so I've been able to take that to the corporate world and hopefully share that with people around me that like, just don't panic, just stop, take a deep breath, make a plan, stick with it. Even if it's a crappy plan, just make a plan and run with it. Um, I think it's really helped me in the corporate world too. Are there any similarities like we use in the corporate world? You know, we say things like fire drill, or I imagine in like security breaches. I mean, we, we equate those to like 911 calls. Like, are there practices or, or behaviors that you've, you've hoped to or wanted to bring to the corporate world that works really well in when it really is life or death or when it really is a, <laughs> a fire that can cause harm? Yeah, there are some things that I would love to bring to the corporate world, like IAPs, which are incident action plans, which people at a fire department will get around and say, okay, what happens if we have an earthquake in our town and a bunch of bears run down from the woods and start eating people? What are we going to do? They'll just make up scenarios and we'll write those down and we'll have a written plan for what happens when we have an earthquake. And as soon as the bears start to come down from the woods, what are we going to do? Um, we actually made a zombie response plan as a part of, of our, I mean, we just make up scenarios and then we have an incident action plan and study it to where if something like that does happen, we have something to fall back on where the person in command will be like, here's my zombie response plan. Okay, let's start moving. I wish we could do a little bit more of that in the corporate world. Like what happens if something wild takes place, somebody can just kind of bring up a plan and say, let's do this and execute it. Um, it sounds silly, but it's, you know, it's not important until it is type of thing. That's awesome. Uh, I wanted to give you a platform. Like, is there anything you would say to anyone that's on the fence about how much time they invest in professional development and, and skill development, like anything that you found helpful to, to break through kind of those creative or, or philosophical roadblocks that we sometimes run into? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that I think um, I would like to express to people is to just be a fearless learner. And what I mean by that is don't be afraid to learn something and think, well, that's for X type of people or that's for these people. Um, because I've, I've dealt with that myself, you know, personally through the years where I've thought, well, that's for the mathematicians of the world or that's for you know, something like that. And so I'm like, I'm not going to learn that. But then as soon as I did start to take steps and learn something that I was really interested in learning, I found out, okay, you don't need to be a mathematician to do this. That's awesome. And so I think the earlier in your career that you can realize that those barriers don't exist, the better, like the, the earlier you can say, I want to be a rocket scientist. Cool. Start. There's probably a book on Amazon. that will be a good starting place, you know, like, um, so that's probably one of my biggest advice. Just be a fearless learner. Don't be afraid and don't say I'm not a tech person because everybody's a tech person one way or another. Um, and if you want to learn it, you can learn it. Um, another good piece of advice that someone gave me years ago is to listen to everybody. So um, the cleaning crew, the janitors may have better ideas than the CEO. Just listening to every single person who's willing to speak about things will change your perspective because we all get kind of horse blinders. And, um, and I've done that before where I'm leading engineering teams and I just think this is what we care about. And this is all that matters where there are people outside that are like, Hey, you, you all are missing something here big. And if none of us listen to that person, then we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and keep struggling where there's, there's somebody there that's like, Hey, I know how to open that gate for you. You know, <laughs> stop jiggling the handle <laughs> type of thing. Um, so listening to everybody is, is super important. Like listen to everyone around you. Don't, uh, think in ranks, you know, like this person isn't ranked high enough to have a great opinion. Yeah. That's totally false. Yeah. Listen down and ask questions up. I think that's a great strategy and, and you can go a long way. Okay, Jeremy, to conclude this interview, we like to have a little fun with our guests. 
So uh, my social media team has armed me with a few random rapid fire questions to hype the algorithms and wake the Twitter trolls. So if you're ready, uh, I'm going to ask you a few of these and just want short rapid fire answers. You game? Yeah. Okay. Question number one. If you could switch legs with any animal, what would it be? Uh, thoroughbred. Horse. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Dream car? Uh, 65 427 SC Cobra. Dream engine? 427 side oiler that goes in that Cobra. <laughs> Off-road or asphalt? Uh, Off-road, definitely. Rock or mud? Mud. And paint color? Uh, ruby red is probably my favorite. Okay, I, I maybe I maybe have led the jury here, but what's your, what's a secret talent? A uh, secret talent that I have? Um, let's see, drafting. I can do uh, architectural and mechanical drafting at a halfway decent level. I thought you'd you'd go down my theme of you're a you're a pretty big uh, car junkie, but uh, I <laughs> maybe yeah. secret talent uh, making rusty old vehicles drive down the road and be roadworthy. <laughs> That's the secret talent. Um, anything you're reading right now? Um, I'm reading. Ah, I can't remember the name of it now. Why, the Coral Island? Something like I can't even remember the title, but just I love books that were written before television was invented. It's my favorite. Awesome. Dream vacation. Uh, I haven't really thought about this very much. Probably Italy. I think would be cool. Team cat or team dog? Team dog, hundred <laughs> percent. And finally, if you were a flavor of ice cream, Jeremy, what would it be? <laughs> I'd say vanilla. <laughs> I don't have a big giant personality. A vanilla with a little bit of sprinkles to make it interesting. Uh, the world's okayest flavor meets the world. <laughs> That's flavor. right. See, you it, it all lines up. <laughs> it uh, it's the perfect way to end. Well, Jeremy, thanks a lot for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. We'll put links out to some of these courses and authors that Jeremy mentioned in the show notes. We hope everyone will follow and subscribe and review our series. We're open to feedback. We'd love to hear how we can improve this spotlight form format and look forward to you joining us on future episodes. Thanks, Jeremy. We'll talk to everyone yeah, later. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody.